Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, I am Rajarshi Das, welcome to Hare Krishna today. On today's program I have a special guest with me. His Grace Shesha Das, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada and a practicing attorney at law. Shesha Prabhu, welcome to the program. Thank you very much Rajarshi Prabhu. Shesha Prabhu has formerly been our governing body commissioner, Trinidad and Guyana also and has visited us many times in the Caribbean. So, Shisha Prabhu, uh, perhaps um, you can tell us about, you know, what is inspirational about the Vedic path, you know. Shisha Prabhu is going to tell us about things in the Vedic teachings that are of inspiration. So, you can please, you know, delineate, you know, these different topics for us. Okay, thank you very much, Rajasthi Prabhu. I'm happy to uh, be with you here today. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you. A question I often get when I meet with people to explain to them the science of Krishna consciousness is, why do you follow uh, an ancient religion, a uh, religion with ancient teachings? Um, as you may know, this tradition we follow uh, comes, uh, originates uh, in India uh, in the Vedic scriptures, which are thousands and thousands of years old. So people wonder, well, how, how is that, some, some books that were written thousands and thousands of years ago, how are they relevant to us today in the modern world? And, and why, why would you follow them? Um, so I thought we'd explore that a little bit today. And I'd like to begin with trying to understand what it means that uh, ancient religious scriptures or religious texts. Um, Actually, in Sanskrit, the word uh, is not ancient, but it's sanatan, sanatan dharma, or eternal uh, religious uh, teachings. Now, um, eternal religious teachings is even older than ancient, so <laughs> <laughs> we seem to be going more and more back in time. But let's try to understand what it means eternal. Actually, eternal doesn't mean... Um, a time-bound thing where we have a timeline that goes back forever or goes into the future forever. Rather it means universal. Teachings which are uh, relevant to our lives uh, at every time, place, and circumstance throughout history. Um, when we look at the nature, the condition uh, of human beings, that really hasn't changed over the, the centuries. We can see people face the same kind of problems in their everyday life. Uh, the Vedic scriptures give the four birth, death, old age, and disease. Now, these things are not modern, uh, although they have maybe different expressions in modern times than they did in previous times, uh, but they're not a, just a condition of modern man. They're a condition of man throughout time. These, these uh, miseries that are described in the Vedic literatures, and so um, that's what is addressed by uh, the Vedic literatures or Sanatana Dharma. How to deal with these uh, factors in, in our lives, these things which often cause us uh, bewilderment and distress in, in so many ways. So how does a religion uh, deal with those things uh, effectively enough so that it is um, practice throughout time. Uh, that's that's the, the real issue and, and that's where I, I think we find uh, answers in the Vedic uh, paradigm. Uh, three things we can determine that happen to our lives when we follow this religious trend tradition. One is that we get relief from, uh, immediate relief from different miseries that are uh, plaguing us in life from uh, modern day stress to um, uh, the hard labor that uh, is characteristic of um, 
of many societies around the world, we can get immediate relief, relief from these um, types of miseries in life. Um, and, and second, we get knowledge. We get factual knowledge of who we are. It's often called self-realization. You'll find many uh, uh, groups these days talking about self-realization. Who is really the self? Uh, how does the self relate to this world around us? How does the self relate to God? A knowledge of these things are found in the Vedic scriptures and therefore they make them relevant to our life. Uh, and then um, number three, uh, Paramgati uh, in Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the main scriptures of the Vedic um, literatures, uh, this, these words are there, Paramgati, they mean that at the end we get the supreme destination. We get a chance to go back to the spiritual world and live there uh, in a loving relationship with the Supreme Lord. And so these are three things that we get from, from worshiping uh, and, and following the Vedic paradigm. Uh, I did a little research to, to um, try to understand how people live their lives now and what they might do over if they had a chance to do it again. And I found a survey that was published um, by The Guardian, which is a newspaper in the UK. And I'd like to share with you uh, five top regrets people have in their lives um, uh, without worshiping God, uh, and especially without the, the benefit of the eternal religious principles found in the Vedic scriptures. So the five top regrets, and uh, note what these regrets have to say about the quality of one's life. Because as I mentioned, there are three things, three benefits we get from following the Vedic literatures, immediately relief from all suffering, knowledge, effective knowledge to change our lives, and then the eternal destination at the end of life. Uh, see how these three things impact the five items mentioned here. Number one, I wished I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. This is one of the top regrets that people have when they die. And it directly means that there was no self-realization in their life. Self-realization means, again, understanding ourselves, how we relate to the world around us, and how we relate to God. Um, in the absence of that, people spend their lives trying to meet others' expectations of them, and ultimately, uh, they're not satisfied. A man will work hard to satisfy his wife and children, or society at large, uh, and often those very people that one works their life hard for aren't satisfied, no matter how much sacrifice is made. I think the best example of this is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi in India spent his whole life, from the time he was a very young man, working tirelessly in a very self-sacrificing way for the benefit of the Indian people. And they killed him. And then, toward the end of his life, uh, unfortunately, he, he was assassinated by his own people. They were dissatisfied. This is a good example to say how we live our life to meet the expectations of others and there's just not the satisfaction there. Uh, spiritual life directed by the Vedic scriptures gives us a different perspective. It's based on self-realization. When we understand that Aham Brahmasmi, I'm a spirit soul, I'm not of this material nature around us. I'm, I'm a different, I'm of a different nature. This nature is impermanent, uh, temporary, full of miseries. I'm eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. That combination is like oil and water. It just does not mix. And so following the Vedic traditions means self-realization, understanding myself as spirit, soul, and acting in that way. And in that way, trying to find happiness, um, not in this regretful way that many people have. 
So let's look at the second reason. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Hmm. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Um, all of us are forced by the material nature in different ways to work very hard and this is where we are dissatisfied with our work. Not only are we not able to satisfy others, but even personally we find a lot of dissatisfaction by having worked so hard and sacrificed things which are, cause, are causes for enjoyment in our life. Um, there's a popular um, advertisement that you find here in uh, the United States where I live um, and it said you have to stop sometime and smell the flowers <laughs> because we tend to miss the, the ordinary beautiful things in life because we're working so hard so we have to, they say stop to smell the flowers I, I would change that you know I, I'd say stop to understand the nature of the self stop to understand the nature of God this is what the purpose of human life is meant for animals are also working very hard are human beings meant to be animals what's the difference between a human being and an animal the difference is is that rather than working hard simply working hard with one's energies in life to apply those energies to understanding the eternal nature of the self and, and our relationship with God and when we do that we find we don't have to work so hard God will provide for us he does provide for us every religious tradition teaches this every religious teaching uh, gives us the idea that if we depend upon God then he'll supply our necessities he'll afford us the time in our life to in investigate what is our relationship with him God is the maintainer. Uh, we find that, as I said, in all religious traditions. Number three in regrets list here, moving on. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Our true feelings are often bottled up into us and we're confined by societal considerations uh, or financial considerations, familial considerations, so many different things prevent us from expressing our real self. Uh, and therefore, at the end of life, we feel we've wasted life because we really couldn't be ourselves. So my question to all of you that may be feeling that, or may be able to understand that in the feelings of others, what are you doing to express your real self? What do you know about your real self? The real self is described in Bhagavad Gita as being eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. Not able to be cut by weapons, dried by the wind, soaked by the rain. All the miseries you find in this world can't affect the true self. And when you have this knowledge from studying the Vedic literatures, you'll find that you become aloof from the miseries of life. And I'll give you one example. We often become very attached to or identify very closely with our material possessions. Just like an automobile, for instance. If you have an automobile or a car, you think that, well, this is my car. And it's more than that. We start to identify personally with that car. So that if we get to have the misfortune of getting into an accident with another car, we immediately jump out and tell, tell the other driver, you hit me! No, no, they didn't hit you, they hit the car. <laughs> but, but because we're identifying so closely with that car, we feel that we've actually been personally assaulted by that uh, other automobile running into our automobile. This type of misidentification, as you can see, causes us great misery. And so the point of the Vedic instructions is to get away from these misidentifications of the self, understanding our true self, uh, and therefore being aloof from so many of the material miseries that happen to the body. The body is not our self. Um, but we identify with it so closely that it might as well be. 
Knowledge helps to cut this. Bhagavad Gita describes that we're required to use a sword of knowledge. He gives the example of using the sword and cutting through uh, a tangle of ropes and knots that are binding us to this world. Knowledge can set you free. Uh, and knowledge will free you specifically from the different miseries you find in the world. So um, let's move on to next number four. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Um, life in this material world is, con is, is compared to life in an ocean. Now in the ocean we find the waves, they come together and they go apart, they come together and they go apart. And often we'll find uh, clumps of seaweed or straw floating in the ocean. And that ocean sometimes brings different clumps together and it sometimes separates them. That's compared to how we come together in friendship and we're separated by time and friendship in this material world. Um, it's unfortunate, but just like in the ocean, you cannot control it. That's its nature and that's how it acts. That's the experience we have with friends and family. We're brought together and then we're separated in the course of time. Uh, a very unfortunate situation, but that's the nature of this world. We have to understand that and live our life in such a way that we don't, we're not acting in illusion of how this world actually operates. Uh, again, having knowledge of how the world operates, that it does like this, it brings people together and separates us over the course of time, gives us the intelligence to make the best use of the time that we have together because the forces of nature will separate us over the course of time. People lament that they couldn't stay in touch with their friends, um, but if they understood this fact of the way the material nature works, at least knowledge would give them some solace. And finally, finally here, the fifth list on this list of regrets that people have, dying people have, I wish I'd let myself be happier. I wish I'd let myself be rest. How, how can we achieve happiness in life, lasting happiness? Uh, we turn to ancient or eternal religious scriptures to find out how people in the past uh, achieved happiness, a lasting happiness. Certainly it can't be in this ocean uh, uh, where we're brought together for a temporary time and separated uh, for, uh, quickly over the time. Certainly that can't be the lasting permanent source of happiness. But as I've introduced to you already in going through these five, the lasting source of happiness is understanding our eternal nature. The eternal nature of the soul and the eternal nature of our relationship with the Supreme Lord. Um, understanding that and acting within that is what gives us happiness because we never have to fear. We never have to fear about being separated. We never have to fear about all of the different miseries that we find in this world that we get relief from immediately by understanding our nation, our relationship with God. Um, all of these things are taken care of and they're all incorporated in this idea of understanding our eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord and acting within that relationship. So these are some reasons why we go to uh, an ancient uh, religious tradition, ancient scriptures, to find the answers that are applicable, as I said, universally, all places, all times, all peoples. It's not that this is just a Hindi, Hindu religion. It's not just for Indian people. It's not just for Americans or Europeans or Africans. It's for everybody. Uh, because it's based on the soul. The soul is not these temporary designations that are associated with the body. Um, and so everyone can take to this process of Krishna consciousness. And it, it's, it's very easy actually. It, uh, it's just a matter of chanting, glorifying the names of God. Shisha Prabhu, perhaps you can tell us uh... Srila Prabhupada created such an impact, you know, on the lives of people around the world. 
Can you speak a bit about some of the principles or practices that you know people actually found beneficial to incorporate into their lives because we know for sure people they took up the chanting process but what are some of the things that people did that actually gave them the satisfaction you know to continue practicing hmm. well continued practice of Krishna consciousness uh, as you mentioned Rajar Prabhu, is, is going to be foundationally based on chanting Hare Krishna uh, and so devotees of Krishna take that as a regular part of the daily of their daily lives uh, but they also incorporate things such as um, studying the scriptures on a regular basis, uh, associating with others who make this commitment in life, uh, and um, doing simple things like acting with gratitude to the Supreme Lord. How do we act with gratitude to the Supreme Lord in our daily life? We can do that by making an offering of what we eat to the Supreme Lord. You'd be surprised how much eating time that takes in everyone's life. I mean, the whole endeavor to eat takes so much time in everyone's life. But if you're able to dedicate that time and the results of that time to the Supreme Lord, um, then see how much benefit you get and see how much of your life can be dedicated to, to God by doing that. So therefore, devotees of the Lord, they, first of all, they eat only vegetarian food. They make a vow to separate themselves from the, the cruelty that, uh, that's there in uh, um, modern uh, meat-eating slaughterhouses, um, to separate themselves from that cruelty as religious people, uh, understanding the spiritual nature of those beings. Uh, and uh, that Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, give me a leaf, a fruit, a flower. He's advocating that we give him this type of vegetarian food, so we offer our food to Krishna. Uh, and in that way, uh, we show our gratitude. The example is given just like a small child. Sometimes you'll see a child will, he'll, he'll have some food and he'll offer it to his parent first. You know, you, you eat it. And, and then, so it's a similar kind of thing. It's showing gratitude. The child's showing gratitude to the parent. And so the devotee shows gratitude to the Lord by offering his food to the Lord. Um, uh, another um, thing that the devotees add to their lives is to try to help others. This is so important in order to really be happy in life, is to try to help others. If you have something, if you have knowledge of something, or if you have some ability, and you see others that are struggling and suffering without that ability, then you can only really be satisfied by trying to benefit that person's suffering. And so we find it's characteristic among devotees that have this knowledge from the ancient Vedic scriptures that they try to give that knowledge to others, try to enlighten others um, for the benefit of society. What about uh, people, they want to do good for society, so they may just think, yeah, I want to do some welfare work, you know, okay, I'll give some poor people some clothing, I'll, you know, give some this and that. Uh, is there a difference between, you know, giving them a connection with God as compared to just, you know, trying to do something good for the bodily maintenance? Right. That's, that's a very good question. Um, how do transcendental activities or activities in the service of the Lord differ from uh, activities that uh, benefit people uh, in their material conditions? Um, I think it's important to understand that in order to really help someone, you have to get them out of the material conditioning altogether. And here's the example that's given in that regard. If someone's having a nightmare, then, and you, you happen to be observing that person, you can see physically they're tossing and turning on the bed, they're obviously they're in great distress having a nightmare. How are you going to help that person? You might consider that, well, let me lay down next to the person, go to sleep and, and enter him into a dream and I'll help him that way. <laughs> but you may get caught in your own nightmare that way and you may not be able to help him. But obviously the way to help him is to wake him up. 
is to wake him up. And so giving a person a relationship with God is meant to wake them up. It's meant to wake them up from the dream. And so therefore, we try to engage people in as closely as possible direct service to the Supreme Lord uh, as opposed to just trying to better their material condition in life. Not that that's neglected or not that that's a devotee of the Lord's callous to the material condition of life of someone, but the ultimate benefit is what we try to, to give to people. And uh, I think that given the emergency nature of the situation where we're in this temporary life, <clears throat> uh, we have to try to, as soon as possible, give people the most full type of medicine that we can. Therefore, we try to give directly service to, the, to Krishna, which as described, and I'll finish with this, in our scripture, Srimad Bhagavatam, is described in this verse, life's desire should never be directed towards sense gratification. One should desire only a healthy life or self-preservation, since a human being is meant for inquiry about the absolute truth. Nothing else should be the goal of one's works. This is the sort of model we try to use in giving people uh, as much Krishna consciousness as possible to try to relieve their material miseries. Shishu Prabhu, thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you very much, Arjuna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jagannath Swami, 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 Jagannath Swami,